Hi, everybody. My name is Jerom Pai. I'm a second year emergency medicine resident at Mount Sinai. Today, we are going to be going over hypothermia. So, let's discuss what hypothermia is. It's defined as a drop in core body temperature under 35 degrees Celsius. For those of you not a fan of the metric system, that's 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Hypothermia is not solely a wilderness-based medical condition. It can be found in all communities, especially here in New York City and other urban centers, where in winter you'll have the homeless population exposed to the cold outside. This lecture is going to briefly go over the physics of thermodynamics, and I want to reiterate it will be a brief refresher of the physics. We'll go over the pathophysiology, the grading and physical exam findings, and lastly we're going to go over the most up-to-date treatment recommendations. Let's go over the physics of heat loss. It's important to have a very conceptual understanding of how heat is lost in the body to help direct your therapy for your patients. Heat can be lost via radiation, which is the transfer of heat via electromagnetic waves, conduction, which is the transfer between two objects in direct contact, and convection, which is the transfer between objects and a liquid or gas. Conduction is demonstrated by heat loss to wet clothing, or heat loss to cold, hard ground if you don't have adequate shelter outside in the environment. Convection can be demonstrated by wind chill, and lastly, radiation is general heat loss to ambient temperature, which is consistently happening. Sweat is interesting in the sense that it is evaporative cooling, which is a demonstration of all three methods of heat loss simultaneously. Let's get to the most important part of this lecture, the pathophysiology of hypothermia. Cooling occurs when your body's ability to produce and conserve heat is outpaced by the heat loss to the environment. Hypothermia is when this occurs and causes pathology. Which do you really prefer, if you take a second to think about it? Hot weather or cold weather? What that really comes down to is what you perceive, not actually what your core temperature is. The core temperature is an accurate representation of whether or not a patient is going to be hypothermic. Early on, when a patient experiences cold temperature, they're going to respond via shivering, which functions to use muscular contraction to generate heat. Later on, as the body continues to cool, there will be a sympathetic surge, which results in peripheral vasoconstriction. This serves as a way for blood to be shunted from your extremities to your core in a method to conserve more heat. Early on in hypothermia, you can also have signs of autonomic dysregulation, a good example of this is going to be abnormal vital signs or change in mental status. There is a phenomenon known as paradoxical undressing, which happens in mild to moderate hypothermia. At some point, your body's sympathetic surge can no longer keep up with itself, and you'll have a blunt in the sympathetic response. This results in an increase in peripheral vasodilation, and unfortunately results in blood shunting out of your core into your extremities. As this occurs, you end up perceiving that your body is actually getting warmer because the skin gets better perfusion. A lot of the times you can have patients who feel like they're out in the cold and getting colder and getting colder, and all of a sudden, due to the blood shunting, they start to feel warmer. That will result in some of these patients taking off their clothes and increasing their heat loss. So as we go forward, you need to remember that core temperature is measured via esophageal and epitympanic thermometers. Methods of measuring the temperature for a normal person, such as axillary, oral, temporal, and rectal, don't really work in hypothermia. Rectal is a good way to measure core temperature, but if you're using it for a hypothermic patient, you're going to be undressing them far more than it's going to be useful. Let's start with mild hypothermia. Mild hypothermia is defined as a core temp of 32 to 35 degrees Celsius, or 90 to 95 Fahrenheit. At this stage of hypothermia, your sympathetic response is live and kicking, so your vital signs are going to include tachycardia, tachypnea, and hypertension. Mild hypothermia will present as sustained shivering, early stages of mental status decline, and loss of fine motor skills. What the mental status is for a patient is going to vary from person to person. It can be confusion, agitation, early memory loss. It will not present as a person being acutely obtunded. Mild hypothermia uh, results in an increase in core blood flow. This increases perfusion to your kidneys, which results in increase in urine output. This is referred to as cold diuresis, and unfortunately, the loss of fluid via urine increases the loss of core temperature.
The treatment of mild hypothermia is relatively straightforward. First and foremost, what you want to do is you want to remove the patient from whatever the offending factor is. If they're wearing wet clothing, remove that clothing and replace it with warm clothing. If you can't take off their wet clothing and give them warm clothes, skin-to-skin -skin contact is effective at warming a hypothermic patient. Carbs are really, really important for improving mild hypothermia. Shivering reduces your body's sugar stores very, very quickly. Helping replete that will increase body temperature much faster. Exercise is relatively questionable. Uh, it can be risky due to patients having warmer core temperatures and colder distal temperatures, and exercise can increase blood flow to the distal extremities. You need to generally start these patients on a very moderate and slow exercise regimen. You need to monitor them very closely before they start to increase their activity in any way. Mild hypothermia is the stage where your body is actually able to keep up relatively well. There isn't a physiologic shutdown, and that means that if you can intervene early, these patients have a very good outcome. Moderate hypothermia. This is where we start to get into some of the dicier aspects of the hypothermic cascade. Hypothermia at this stage is defined as 28 to 32 degrees Celsius, or 82 to 90 Fahrenheit. At this point, you're going to have severe depression and mental status. Your patients are going to present with slurred speech or be so obtunded they can't speak at all. They're going to have dilated pupils. At this point, your body is all out of its sympathetic surge, and because of that, they're going to present as bradycardic, uh, bradypneic, and hypotensive. It's important to remember that these patients can be often so cold that the conduction system in the heart is adversely affected. What that means is that if you're jostling these patients around, moving them, or you know, if they get bumped in any sort of adverse way, you risk throwing them into a fatal arrhythmia, whether it's VTAC, PEA, or VFib. Um, you need to be very careful about moving these patients, and currently the Wilderness Medicine Society recommends that these patients, as they're being evac, need to be kept completely horizontal and should not be lifted up or sat up in any way. At this point, you're going to have lost all of your glycogen score stores, which is going to result in patients presenting with complete body rigidity. Moderate hypothermia, if left unchecked, will progress to complete decline because the body is not able to warm itself in any effective way. You have to actively rewarm these patients. Let's talk about how to rewarm the moderately hypothermic patient. There are a lot of myths and different feelings out there on how to warm people up, a lot of different wives' tales and things that people use on a day-to-day -day basis. These things are really, really good at warming cold extremities. They're not a good way to effectively raise someone's core temperature. So let's go into some of them. Chemical heat packs uh, are often used by people in cold weather. They use them to stuff into their socks or gloves, and they result in an increase in heat immediately to a small surface area. For obvious reasons, that's not going to do a lot of good in terms of core temperature, but it also has the added adverse effect of increasing heat so quickly that you can initially cause burns to the skin. Warm baths are not indicated for your moderately hypothermic patients, even though it will distribute heat more generalized and more evenly, uh, there is a phenomenon known as after drop, and it's very, very important to keep an eye out for this. After drop is the effect where your core body temperature drops as you increase the warmth of a person because the peripheral vasodilation results in further heat loss. What you can do for the moderately hypothermic patient is give them warm IV fluids, which is 40 to 42 degrees Celsius. You can give them humidified oxygen, which admittedly isn't great for doing much other than warming the oropharynx, but it is in no way an adverse thing to do for your patient. You can use electric heat pads. Those are much bigger and more evenly distributed heat sources, and it's very good to apply these to the patient's groin, upper back, and axilla. The severely hypothermic patient. These are going to be some of the scariest patients you're going to deal with, and they're going to be very difficult and very tricky as well. Severe hypothermia is defined as a drop in core temp under 28 Celsius or 82 Fahrenheit. These patients are often going to present basically looking dead. They're going to be completely comatose. They're going to have fixed and dilated pupils. 
they're going to basically be at a metabolic standstill. And because they're not shivering and because they've been cold for so long, their muscles are going to be completely rigid. In terms of vital signs for these patients, there's really not a good way to tell. You might put a EKG on someone and you might see that they're in PEA. It's also possible that they're so bradycardic that you're just not able to feel a pulse. If you're in the wilderness, the Wilderness Medicine Society currently recommends a pulse check of up to one minute for a person who's severely hypothermic. What you can do in a hospital setting, however, is throw a quick ultrasound probe on their chest uh, and see if there's any sort of effective cardiac motion. Severe hypothermia is obviously going to be fatal if you leave it untreated. These are critically ill patients with a questionable prognosis, even if you do absolutely everything for them. Uh, record time for a patient who is severely hypothermic to come to full neurologic recovery is 8 hours and 40 minutes of complete circulatory arrest. That was a 68-year-old lady, and she recovered fully. There are many case studies of good neurologic recovery in patients who are severely hypothermic in cardiac arrest for nearly six hours. Um, obviously, this is not a hard and fast rule, and there are a lot of different resuscitation considerations. Let's go over some of the treatment considerations for severe hypothermia. When you initially see these patients, obviously you want to get IV access on them. For obvious reasons, that can be really difficult. You might have difficulty finding a vein or seeing a vein. Central access is effective for these patients, and intraosseous access is effective as well. In terms of their uh, airway and their breathing, these patients are not going to be well protecting their airway at this temperature, seeing as they're completely comatose. So throwing in an LMA or a quick uh, intubation on these patients is very important. When you're intubating these patients, be careful to not move their body around too much. Cardiac irritability is an extremely well-documented phenomenon, and you risk throwing these patients into VTAC or VFib. All of your severe hypothermic patients absolutely need to be on telemetry monitoring, and it's recommended that you get serial EKGs on them as well. The otherwise treatment for severe hypothermia is relatively the same as moderate hypothermia. The important thing is to actively and aggressively rewarm these patients. Uh, things you want to keep an eye out for are the VTAC and VFib that we've talked about. Uh, we also want to keep an eye out on uh, how their core body temperature is doing. It's important when you intubate these patients to throw in an NG tube and make sure it has uh, esophageal temp as well. There is a saying in EMS and wilderness medicine that no one is dead until they're warm and dead. What that is to say is that you have these patients that have CPR, which goes on for hours and hours, and they'll make great neurologic recovery, even though CPR has gone on for eight hours, six hours. Many people uh, have good recovery from that. Delayed intermittent CPR is really only appropriate for these severely hypothermic patients. Well, let's go back to the no one is dead until they're warm and dead saying. That's actually not really recommended anymore. There are some key exceptions to that. The Wilderness Medicine Society says that you do not need to wait for active rewarming of patients who have one of two things. One, an obviously fatal injury, whether they were uh, stabbed repeatedly in the chest or whether or not uh, you know, they have severe brain trauma or uh, decapitation. These are not patients you need to uh, waste your efforts resuscitating. Another one is uh, patients that have been trapped under an avalanche. If they've been trapped for over 35 minutes, uh, it's often recommended that you're not going to be able to resuscitate these patients. Between the hypothermia and the crush injuries, their prognosis is effectively nil. Uh, a lot of these patients also have a lot of snow which impacts their oropharynx and completely makes breathing impossible. So even by the time they are rescued, uh, resuscitation is futile. So what do you want to take home in terms of this lecture on hypothermia? The thing I just want to reiterate is that we talked about some of the extremes of hypothermia, but no matter where you are, as the winter gets colder, you are going to end up dealing with mild and moderate hypothermia. The thing to remember is that primary prevention is key. You want to make sure that if you are going out into the wilderness or you know somebody else that is, you need to make sure they have a high caloric intake before they go to help increase their glucose and glycogen stores. It's also important to prevent conductive heat loss. That's the way you're going to lose heat most in terms of loss to the environment. It's important to layer and insulate your clothing, and you want to make sure that you layer the ground as well. You want to make sure, more than anything else, that you have adequate shelter.
A lot of people feel that alcohol ends up making them feel warmer. Uh, this just goes back to the phenomenon we talked about in terms of vasodilation. It's only a perception of warmth. You're actually just losing your heat faster. You'll have many stories of patients who, uh, in the dead of winter, go to the bar and drink themselves silly, end up walking home, fall asleep, and end up dying of hypothermia. What it really comes down to is when primary prevention fails, you need to make sure that you intervene early and you intervene aggressively. When you're out in the wilderness, uh, we've talked about ways to rewarm people. If you're not able to effectively rewarm people, your priority should be to get them to an effective care center. That means making sure that you can get in touch with EMS, you can evacuate them, and you can get them to somewhere where they can get appropriate and definitive care. That's basically it in terms of hypothermia. Um, make sure that you guys review all of the various methods in which heat can be lost and regained. And if nothing else, make sure that when you go out, you prepare for the prevention of hypothermia rather than the treatment of it.